Stanford University. Um, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to come and talk to you at the Energy Seminar. It's a great honor. Um, so as Sally has mentioned, the, talk of my, uh, the topic of my talk is the energy balance of the PV industry. Um, and specifically, I'm looking at this question is, is the PV industry a net electricity producer? Um, so let me just give you a brief outline, and this is kind of the usual kind of outline that we all have. So we've got the motivation. I'm going to bit, talk a bit about why I think this question is exciting, and I hope I can convey that to you as well. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background, and then talk about methods that we used in order to carry out the, um, the work, the analysis, and again, present my results, and then talk about some conclusions and implications for future research. Okay, so this is a graph that we're often presented with, and this is growth of global installed capacity for PV between uh, 1999 and 2011. Um, and as you can see, the um, growth in capacity is growing very rapidly. So it's growing, uh, the kind of 10-year average between 2000 and 2010 was 40% per year. And this is a good thing, right? The PV industry is renewable. It's clean, emissions-free, so no carbon emissions associated with the electricity production. So sure, and we're obviously putting a lot of money into subsidizing it. So this is a good thing that it's increasing rapidly. Um, but unfortunately, um, unless the PV industry is a net electricity producer, then actually uh, this rapid growth is producing more emissions than it's offsetting. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So one fundamental question is, is the PV industry a net electricity provider? Or to put it another way, does the PV industry consume more electricity than it produces? OK, so as I alluded, um, a lot of money is get put into the PV industry in the form of subsidies. And um, it's normally thought of this as a carbon emission reduction strategy. So it's a way for us to move towards a cleaner energy system. Because, as I said before, PV emits no greenhouse gases during its operation. It does, however, have a lot of carbon emissions associated with its manufacture because fossil energy is used to manufacture and install these PV panels. So, while the PV industry is a net energy sink, it can't be, it can't, it, there's no way that it can offset or reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So the energy balance of the PV industry is critical to the success of this strategy, this carbon emission strategy, uh, carbon emission reduction strategy, sorry. Or to put it another way, the only way in which we know if this carbon reduction strategy is working is to look at the energy balance of the PV industry. Okay? Okay, so let's look at the inputs and outputs um, into a PV system. So initially, you've got some construction, which I'm going to assume happens within one year. And so the amount of energy that goes into the construction of a PV system is this EC. And then once you've um, built and installed this uh, system, then it starts producing energy. And over the whole of its lifetime, it produces some amount of energy, EG, which stands for the gross energy. So what sort of energy um, goes into this construction? Well, around about 90% of the PV industry is currently in the form of crystalline silicon. So the first thing that we have to do is um, purify silicon, and that's a very energy-intensive process. We can see here, this is a, um, a photo from, the, uh, from a new silicon purification plant in Kazakhstan. You can see that <laughs> what we're having to do here is essentially melt rocks. So we have to uh, take this silicon up to, the temp up to about 2,000 degrees centigrade. In order to melt the silicon, we have to hold it at that temperature in order to, uh, for the impurities to settle out. OK, so a lot of energy comes into the uh, purification step. But that's just the first step in the um, process to get to the PV system. So once we've got this polysilicon, we then need to remelt it and hold it at a um, at this high temperature in order to produce a single or multi-crystalline silicon ingot. 
Then once we have that ingot, we have to saw it into these thin wafers. We then have to apply junctions and uh, coatings and um, contacts in order to produce the solar cell. We then assemble many of these cells together. So, excuse me. Many of these cells together with a glass fr uh, fronting and aluminium framing in order to produce the module. And then we um, install many of these modules together to make the system. Um, with, along with the balance of system components, which include things like inverters, transformers. This PV system here will have a tracking system. You also have to have the steel support structure in order to place the, um, place the PV modules. So there's a lot of um, balance of system components and energy associated with that as well. Um, one point to make is that financial costs and energy costs are not always the same. So we have the breakdown of financial costs, and this is from Dick Swanson's um, energy seminar here in November. And this is for um, multi-crystal and silicon. And you can see that a third of the financial cost is associated with the, the balance of system components and the installation of the PV system. Um, whereas when you look at the energy costs, you can see that only 13% of the energy is associated with that final step. Whereas over or around half of the energy is associated with just getting us to the wafer. So immediately we can see that a financial and, uh, anal cost analysis and an energy cost analysis are going to give us different points in the system at which we want to target to reduce those costs. Okay. Okay, so going back to net energy, the net energy from a PV system depends on two factors. First factor is the energy inputs. How much energy is required to manufacture each unit of um, power capacity? I'm going to call this the cumulative electricity demand, and it's measured in kilowatt hours of electricity per peak watt of capacity. And the second factor is the energy output, so how much power or how much energy can each unit of capacity produce? And that's going to be determined by the capacity factor. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. OK, so this first factor, how much energy does it take to manufacture and install a PV system? So in order to um, determine this, well, let me say first, this is the sort of uh, question that uh, life cycle analyses are normally conducted in order to carry out. So they add up all of the energy inputs along the process of manufacturing these systems. Um, and in order to uh, conduct our analysis, we've made a meta-analysis of these LCA studies. So in order to do this, we had to uh, make sure that we had comparable um, numbers between each of the studies. So we took 28 studies. And we made sure that we were looking at the same sorts of things for each one, so that they went through, through to the full system. Did some of them include inverters? Did they not? We had to account for that. Some of them were done in terms of energy inputs per meter squared of panel. So we had to adjust for the different efficiencies of the different panels. And then the other point is that um, to compare the input for, into manufacturing the PV panel with the output of the PV panel, which is in terms of electricity, then we had to um, assume that all of the energy inputs to the PV manufacturing process are in the form of electricity. And this is a pretty good assumption. Around 85 to 90% of the inputs are in the form of electricity. So that's OK. Um, so here we see the results of that meta-analysis. So on this um, vertical axis, we've got the cumulative electricity demand, kilowatt hours per watt peak. And then we've got the um, year of each of these 28 studies um, here. And we can see we've split them up into each of the different PV technologies. So the first two we've got are these wafer-based technologies, single crystal silicon, multi-crystalline silicon. And then we've got the thin film technologies. So this is copper indium diselenide, uh, cad tel and amorphous silicon. Now the first thing we can see is that there's quite a wide range in these estimates. Uh, they cover at least kind of two orders of mag uh, sorry one order of magnitude. 
The third, second thing we can notice is that uh, the wafer-based technologies on app generally have a higher energy cost associated with them than the thin film technologies. And the third thing that we can notice is that there's a general kind of downward trend over time. So it seems like the PV industry is getting better at producing these panels such that the energy cost associated with their production is, is uh, decreasing. Okay. So given that knowledge, how do we then model, to, model this to account for that decreasing energy cost? Well, luckily, um, this is already done uh, for financial costs by um, what's called the learning curve. So here we can see a graph of the logarithm of financial cost in 2008 dollars per watt as a function of cumulative production, or this is the log of cumulative production. And on this um, plot, estimates of the um, cost of the modules, in in the financial cost of these modules, fall onto this straight line here, which is called the learning curve. And this curve is characterized by what's called the learning rate. So, and the learning rate is defined as a fractional decrease in cost for a doubling of production. And here we can see that it, for, for the PV industry as a whole, this learning rate is 19%. So that means each time you double production, then the, pro price, the cost sorry, associated with module production falls by 19%. So let's say when we had produced 100 megawatts, the cost per, per, unit, per watt was around $10. So by the time we produced 200 megawatts, the price would be around $8.10. And there are a number of reasons why the learning, this learning has occurred. So reduced waste with thickness, wire soaring, and all this kind of thing. So if we apply this learning curve to our um, meta-analysis, the results from our meta-analysis, we get these plots here. And I hope you can see these. I don't know how well you can. but um, So we've got exactly the same log-log plots. We've got the horizontal axis is cumulative production. But now the vertical axis, instead of being financial cost, is this cumulative electricity demand. So it's energy cost of manufacturing. And we've divided between the module and the system for each of the different technologies, so single crystal silicon, multi-crystal in silicon, and so on. And you can see we can fit these same sort of learning curves to this energy um, cost data. Um, the only exceptions being ribbon uh, ribbon and uh, SIGs, which is CAD, uh, which I had on the f previous graph as CIS, um, which unfortunately we didn't have enough data to, to fit these curves to. So what we've done instead is assume the learning rate for ribbon is going to be the same as amorphous silicon, it's kind of similar technology. And then the learning rate for SIGs we're going to assume is the same as cadmium telluride. So here we can see we've got the, these learning rates for the module and the system, and the system ones are what we're interested in. And you can see that we're um, falling at around about the same kind of learning rate as we do for the financial costs. So around about this kind of 20% mark for the single crystal silicon. For the thin film technologies, it's slightly slower. Okay, the second factor that goes into the net energy is this capacity factor. And this is defined as the ratio of average to maximum possible power output. So here we can see uh, the, power, the average power output divided by the maximum power output, which is just the peak capacity. Um, so if you imagine a system that's operating half the time, at, at operating at 50% of its maximum power output, then the capacity factor is going to be 50%. So for a PV system, obviously the insulation, which is the sun, uh, direct sunlight, de determines this capacity factor. So obviously as the sun moves across the sky during the day, then the uh, sunlight is not going to be falling directly onto the panel. It's going to be hitting at an angle, which decreases the output from that panel. And then also as we move from winter to summer, then that output is going to change as well. So this capacity factor is going to be a function, some function of the latitude at which the panel is deployed. So what is the sorry? 
So what is the capacity factor for global PV installations? So here we've, got, we've looked at two different data sets. We've got one from the UN Energy uh, Statistics Database and from the EIA. And uh, on the vertical axis, we've got the percent of global installed capacity and then the capacity factor at which um, that, those installations are operating. And we can see that there's a peak in the um, capacity factor around about a um, capacity factor of 12%. So this is a number I want you to hold in your heads because we're going to come back to it a little bit later. Okay, so now we've got these two things, the energy input and the energy output, we can start to define some useful metrics. The first one is this energy returns ratio. So this tells us how many times over our initial energy investment will be paid back to us. The most famous of these is the energy return on investment. And it's defined as energy out divided by energy in. So here we want a big number. We want as much possible energy to be coming back to us for our initial energy investment. The next metric is called the energy payback time. And this tells us how quickly our energy investment is going to be paid back. And here we want as small a number as possible. We want that energy to be, coming, to be paid back quickly. And this is normally um, done in, times of, in terms of years. So here it's defined as the energy that we put in divided by the um, energy flow or the power out. So going back to our inputs and outputs system diagram here, um, we can see that the output, once we've installed this PV system, the output is, uh, the power output is half of the energy, con um, energy for construction. So the energy payback time for this system is going to be two years. And because the system lasts for 25 years, then the energy return on investment is going to be 12.5 years. OK, so I've just said to you that a PV system has an energy payback time of two years. And how can it be that the industry could possibly be a net energy sink? Each of these systems that we're installing has a positive energy return. It's giving us more energy than, it, than we had to put in to install it. So how can the industry be a net energy sink? Well, as you saw, PV systems require large upfront investment. And as the, and as the industry is growing rapidly, then that um, investment to new, cap new capacity is going to be greater than the output of the industry in any year, or maybe, not necessarily. And I'm going to show you this in a couple of examples. So the first example is linear growth. So in the first year, we build one system. And in year two, that system starts producing energy, and we build another system. In year three, that second um, unit starts to produce energy, and we build another system. So you can see that because the flow rate um, is half of the input energy, then after two years, the industry is fueling its own growth. And thereafter, and the, uh, the output energy just continues to increase. OK, but as I told you at the start, the um, PV industry is growing exponentially. So let's look at a different example. And for this, we're going to look at a 50% growth rate. So again, in the first year, we um, build one unit of capacity. And in the second, and that starts to produce in the second year. Then in the, but then in the second year, instead of building one unit, we're going to build one and a half. OK. Then in the second year, uh, sorry, in the third year, those one and a half units start producing energy, but then we're um, installing two, two and a quarter units, and so on and so forth. We just keep on adding year after year after year. And as you can see, the increase in the output is exactly matched by the increase in the inputs uh, each year. So for an energy payback time of two years, the growth rate and a 50% growth rate, the industry only just breaks even. So here we can define this as a relationship between the two. I've lost my pointer. Here we go, a relationship between the two. So the growth rate is inversely related to the energy payback time. And that's another important thing to hold, into your head, hold, your, hold in your head for later. OK, so let's zoom out a little bit more. And instead of looking at um, time in years, let's look at kind of decades-long timescales. So now I'm looking at this, this industry that 
um, starts to grow exponentially initially, but obviously no physical system can do that forever. So at some point it's gonna um, slow down in growth and reach some limit, okay? Now in this example, the industry initially is growing more rapidly than it can fuel its own growth. So it goes into net negative um, output. Then because the growth rate slows down, this net output starts to turn the corner and at some point starts to become positive. And we can define this crossover point as the break-even year. Now because um, the net output was negative, that energy to supply that had to be imported from outside of the industry. So, oops, sorry. so we can see that this is uh, basically an uh, equivalent to some, an energy subsidy. And then at some point in the future, enough energy, net energy will have been produced such that this area here is equal to this area here. And we can define when that happens as the payback year. So this energy has paid back the initial energy subsidy. Okay, let's switch tack slightly now and go back to the growth rate. So we previously saw that the growth rate is inversely proportional to the energy payback time. And we can show that on this graph here of growth rate versus energy payback time. So that inverse relationship just sits along this line here. And for the example that I showed you before, we've got a two year energy payback time is equivalent to a 50% growth rate. Okay, well let's introduce another concept. Instead of um, reinvesting all of the energy output from that system, we now want to reinvest only some of it so here we see these curves of different fractional reinvestment. Um, and now maybe instead, of, we've still got a two year energy payback time, but instead of investing 100%, we're gonna invest 60%. This means that our growth rate is now limited to 30%, okay? Okay, so let's change this slightly. And instead of having linear axes, we're gonna go into logarithmic axes. And this means that these, uh, these fractional reinvestment curves now sit as straight lines. And we can also say that the fractional reinvestment can be greater than 100%. So this is when the system is act uh, the industry is acting in this net, negative, uh, net energy sink region. And the 100% fractional reinvestment line now represents a break-even threshold. If you're on one side of it, you're a sink. If you're on the other side of it, you're an energy source. And again, we see this two-year um, energy payback time is proportional to, uh, is related to a 50% growth rate. Okay, the next thing that we can do, right. the next thing that we can do is this horizontal axis can be defined either in terms of the energy payback time or in terms of electricity demand, cumulative electricity demand or the energy cost. So if you remember from a few slides ago, we were looking at the distribution of the capacity factor. Well, for an 11.5% capacity factor, we get an, uh, this relationship between the energy payback time and cumulative electricity demand such that a kil if, if the um, energy cost of producing each watt of um, capacity is one kilowatt hour, then at 11.5 capacity factor, that system will pay back in one year. So now we, we can either work in terms of energy payback time or in terms of cumulative electricity demand. Okay, so if an um, industry is in this, net in this net energy sink region, it has a few options that it can um, go through in order to come down into this energy source region. It can either slow its growth and not decrease its um, energy demand, or it can reduce its energy um, demand per watt P, or it can do some, com or it can do some combination of both, okay? So what else can we show on this plot? We can show um, the different growth in installed capacity in different regions around the world. So here at the top, we can see the EU, which is increasing at 66% per year. We could, oh, sorry. <laughs> we can also see the growth rate in the US, which is around about 
32% per year. And the growth rate in the whole uh, global average growth rate is around about 40% per year, as I said before. So we can see that for, a, um, for the global average growth rate, and to be, for the industry to be on the break e at the break-even threshold, the energy payback time has to be 2.5 years. Or uh, equivalently, the embodied energy of each watt of capacity has to be 2.5 kilowatt hours. OK, so now let's see how, the, how each of these technology, each of the different technologies of the PV industry is actually performing on this plot. So you can see here the growth trajectory for single crystal silicon from 2000 to 2010. And you can see that in 2000, the um, cumulative electricity demand was between 6 and 7 kilowatt hours per watt peak. And the growth rate was around about 16%, which meant that this, the uh, technology at that point was sitting r just on this break-even threshold then went through this rapid growth phase where it jumped up to 30% per year. Because it's during that time we're increasing installed capacity, then there is some learning which reduces the um, cumulative electricity demand. But, not, but it, the growth rate is such, fast enough such that kind of the growth outpaces the learning that's happening. So instead of just moving along this break-even threshold, it moves into the net energy sink region and continued to do so until 2010. But as you can see, it's kind of moving closer to this break-even threshold. Um, how does this look for the other technologies? Well, you can see a similar kind of pattern for all but one of them. So all of them start off at around about growth rate of 16%, uh, which are, and they're all in this net um, positive energy uh, supply region. And all of them, except uh, ribbon PV, accelerate out, out into this net energy sink region. Um, you can also see a difference between, so here is single crystal silicon and here is multi-crystalline silicon, which is the other wafer-based technology, um, which kind of hit up to a growth rate around about 60 70%. The thin film technologies, CATEL and SIGs, are exploding in growth at well over like 100% growth rates. So each year we're installing as much capacity as is existing. Um, but pretty much all of these technologies are sitting in this net energy sink region in 2010. Okay, so this is where our historical data finishes. So um, in order to model out into the future, oh, we're going to have to make some some assumptions. Okay, so we've got historical data from 2000 to 2010. Um, we want to model this system out to 2025, so we're going to have to make one assumption about the growth rate. And we're going to assume that growth continues at the average 2005 to 2010 rate. We're also going to need to account for the uncertainty in our two factors, the energy input, so the energy cost of manufacturing, and the capacity factor. And the way that we're going to account for that uncertainty is via a Monte Carlo simulation. And I'll explain a bit more about that in a second. And this modeling was done in a systems dynamics package mod called Vensim. OK, so here we've got our model structure. We've got some initial conditions, so the historic installed capacity, the initial embodied electricity, and the learning rate and capacity factor. Then in each year that the model runs, we're going to update the values of the installed capacity and the embodied electricity as the system is learning. And then we're going to put out the results of the gross power output, the amount of um, power to construct, to, to construct new capacity, and then the net power output as well. Okay, so let's look a bit about dealing with the uncertainties. Um, so Monte Carlo simulation, basically you start with one input, um, one of the input parameters, which you um, pick at random from some distribution. You then run the model and take the value of the output parameters. You then change the input parameters and run the model again and get a new output parameter. And you keep on doing this and doing this until you, all of the output parameters you have some distribution across all of them that reflects the distribution of the input parameters. 
So what we use for the distribution of the input parameters, well, I already showed you what the distribution was for the global installed capacity factors. What about the initial embodied electricity? Well, here we use these learning curves that we produced for, from our meta-analyses, and we look at the spread of these um, estimates across, about this mean learning, learn, learning curve, and that will give us this distribution here which we can then define and put into the model and run the model. Okay, so what results do we get when we run through this? So here you can see um, power production. So this is annual electricity production in terawatt hours per year. Uh, the blue dots, we've got a histori uh, historical um, estimates for power output. The green line we've got is the mean value of the gross electricity output across all of these runs. We can see that this green line runs through the historical data, so that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, the next point is that um, we've got this red line, which is the mean net output across all of these um, simulations. And then the shaded regions represent one standard deviation and two standard deviations about that mean value. So the first thing to notice is that initially the system goes into a net negative um, output and then crosses over at some point and becomes positive thereafter. So if we look at this inset here, um, the initial time at, um, at which this system go, becomes a net positive producer is sometime around 2009. The mean value crosses at 2012 and then um, the latest value the latest time at which it crosses is sometime in 2016. Looking instead at the cumulative electricity production, so when this line crosses, that tells us when the system pays back its initial energy investment. And we can see that sometime between 2012 and 2018, with the mean value being around about 2015. Okay, so just to reiterate, the PV industry is now likely to be a net electricity producer with about 50% likelihood. The PV industry will become a net, a net power provider sometime in the certainty between 2009 and 2016. And the industry will pay back the electricity consumed in its early growth between 2012 and 2018. Okay, so what are some of the implications that, that come out of this analysis? Well, the first thing um, that I showed you earlier is that not all financial cost reductions are going to lead to reductions in embodied energy. So as I showed you, the breakdown of the financial costs, there was a large portion of which goes into the system. And in terms of the energy costs, uh, there's a, uh, that's only a small portion. Um, so economic analysis need to be supplemented with these energy analysis so that we're picking out the right points in the system in which to make these cost reductions. The second point is a fairly obvious one, but PV systems with lower embodied energy provide more net energy to, this, to the overall energy sector. And all other things being equal, these systems will also cost less money and have lower associated greenhouse gas emissions. Um, a third point is that reducing embodied energy of PV should be an explicit goal of te technology development, and I hope you have convinced you as to the reasons why this is a good goal. Um, another point is that we should focus on improving the capacity factor of PV system deployment. So at the moment, 40% of um, PV systems are being installed in Germany, where they're getting a capacity factor of around about 12%. So maybe we want to start to think that Instead of deploying in Germany, we should deploy elsewhere in Europe maybe or more in the States where we can get a better capacity factor and get more kind of bang for our buck. I've also mentioned before that a major reason for subsidizing PV is the greenhouse gas emissions benefits. Um, but that emissions reduction can only occur after the PV industry has paid back its initial energy investment. So as we saw, that's sometime between now and possibly not until the end of this decade. But also, that's, the emissions reduction is heavily dependent on the locations of both manufacturer and deployment. So at the moment, we're manufacturing PV systems in, in China, 
which is using a lot of coal-based electricity, and then we're deploying them in Europe where they don't use so much coal. So in actual fact, this is going to push out the, bound, the um, payback year in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So this is something else that we want to think about. Maybe we want to start manufacturing PV plants, uh, PV systems, in places where we use uh, carbon-free electricity already. Maybe we want to be installing them in places that have a lot of coal-based electricity. Okay, so where else can we go with this research? Well, I think I alluded to there being this tension between the rate at which the system grows and the rate at which the learning occurs in order to reduce the, the, the embodied energy cost. So from this, you can start to define a kind of optimal growth trajectory at which you can kind of move your way along this break-even threshold. We need to start to think about um, optimal uh, energy deployment strategies in terms of this break-even threshold, perhaps. Another thing that we can do is break down the learning curve into um, different components, so especially in terms of the module and the balance of system components. And the reason for this is the balance of systems, the inverters, the transformers, are made up of old technologies. So their learning rates are slower because they're mature technologies, whereas the module learning rate is fast because it's a newer technology. So what would happen is you have this balance of system learning curve, and the module um, learning curve is coming down to hit it. And once it starts to hit it, then the learning rate of that whole PV system is slowed by the balance of system learning rates. So what we want to do is try and tease out those two different effects by looking at the different components. Another thing we can do with this is extend uh, this energy learning curve concept to other energy technologies, so maybe wind or even storage technologies as well. And then look at the effects of storage on the embodied um, energy of renewable systems. So I talked earlier a little, um, a little bit about comparing inputs and outputs of um, PV systems, and we had to talk about them in terms of electricity. Well, if we want to talk about, um, if we want to compare PV systems with um, fossil-based systems, then maybe we need to start talking about in terms of dispatchable electricity, in which case we have to start accounting for the um, storage required in order to do that. Okay. And that's me done. I'd, I'd like to make my thanks to GSEP for funding this research. Thanks to lots and lots of people that um, gave me comments and uh, helped me kind of work through these ideas. And thanks to you also for listening. Okay, questions. Oh, you've got your hand up. <laughs> so um, if, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking about you know, all kinds of growth models. And if, if something can't go on forever, it probably won't. So uh, surely we can't sustain, you know, 50% growth rates. Um, you can do that with the amount that you have small, but after a while, they have to, it does have to taper off somewhere. Um, so, you know, how, what do we do about that, uh, about that issue? Maybe, is it the argument that things are still small enough that we can sustain those rates for a while anyway? Um, well, that's exactly like why analysis like this is important, because as the PV industry is small, or a small fraction of the whole um, energy sector, then it's fine that it's a net energy sink. It doesn't matter. But as you say, as it starts to become a bigger and bigger fraction of the overall system, then those, um, that energy that you're having to put in to grow the system can start to disrupt other, um, other aspects of the economy. So it's better to kind of have a heads up about that rather than just kind of blindly following into it. And then all the PV industry growth suffers just because everything else in the economy suffers. Does that make sense? Okay, more questions. Yeah. Uh, any, any students? No. Any people who are going to run a public company? So, Nick. So, so, <laughs> What, um, how much work were you able to find that has been done on the energy learning curve and, and disaggregating that from the, from the financial learning curve effects and, and, and how much progress has been made further back in the supply chain around this? Um, none. This is 
as far as I know, the first work that's been done on the energy learning curve. Um, I've seen some estimates, so some people in the LCA literature are starting to think in terms of the dynamics, but it's more in terms of updating the values for embodied energy or greenhouse gas emissions from the technologies rather than stringing them together and saying, oh, look, we're learning down here. It's more like, well, these guys were using this old number. That's no good because we're now here. Yeah. <clears throat> Here and then we'll go back to you guys. And then, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so it's all very interesting, but um, it seems to be missing something. Uh, for one thing, the modeling assumes a particular kind of distribution and so forth, and, and those of us with statistics background are always suspicious of that. But the point is that that uh, Stanford is doing research on reducing the amount of silicon per cell, increasing the efficiency for, per cell, and a lot of people around the world are doing that. And, and with different technologies, completely different technologies from silicon, in mm -hmm. fact. So how can you, I mean, it's all well and good to do this for the existing technology, but I, I think a change in the technology always, all of a sudden brings us up to about 30% efficiency per cell. Makes a huge difference in, in, what, in what your payback time is. It takes that curve and chops it down so it doesn't go down as far and it comes back up faster. Uh, less silicon per cell by half is what they're looking at right now. Mm -hmm. it changes everything completely. So why, why try to use this kind of a model that's based on historical stuff that isn't going to be relevant for newer technology? Um, I guess the main reason is that's part of why we're doing this analysis, to feed into these new directions for research. Um, so looking at which factors are important, which things we need to focus on, and which things maybe aren't so important. Um, the second point is that um, some of these technology improvements that you're talking about are not going to be able to be employed in installed systems until 10 years down the line or something like that. So in actual fact, a lot of the technologies that we have now are going to be around for 10, 15, 20 years and still being deployed. There's one part that you that is missed completely here, and that's that one minus efficiency is heating waste, and that offsets the GHG reduction by generate, generating direct heat to the atmosphere. So that's a problem that it's very not usually recognized in the models as they exist now. So anything that increases efficiency reduces the one minus efficiency number very quickly. And, and that changes the overall impact in relation to GHG uh, compensation and so forth. So mm -hmm. it'd be nice to see that in the model, too. OK. Anyway, moving on. How uh, about right there? Yeah. OK. Um, first of all, thanks for uh, coming here and presenting. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about, um, um, what is it, um, net payback and energy. You mentioned that it was supposed to be um, expected to be happening uh, starting in this year and coming um, across the decade. Do you know um, of any particular, you know, say, countries or types of technologies or companies are taking the lead in this? So right now, do you think some uh, I don't know, certain sectors of the PV industry are coming closer to this goal than others? Um, yeah, well, um, the slide that I showed you, um, which had all of the different uh, technologies and their growth paths. Uh, ribbon silicon has actually um, always been within the net, yeah, net um, energy source region. Oh, no, too far, too far, too far. This one. Oh, <laughs> too many drivers. Okay, so here we can see that actually ribbon silicon has always been in this net um, energy source region, um, which is strange because Ribbon silicon is actually the one that's kind of losing market share to all of the other technologies. But you see a tremendous improvement in all of them. I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, enormous improvement. Yeah. Um, and you can see that, like, CAD TEL is actually getting around to a, an energy payback time of around about one year. So it's uh, like kind of way beyond the silicon technologies. But just because it's growing so rapidly, it's growing at like nearly 180% per year. 
uh, or it was in 2010. So it's just gone right into this kind of net energy sink region. Yeah. Yeah, how about you? Yeah, the other structure. Uh, so first of all, thank you for doing this. I work in the solar industry and we have that, our factory has that fire picture that you have and I have something at cocktail parties to say that it is a good thing. Uh, my question to you is, you know, what natural gas is 250 per mm BTU? Does that take away the financial incentive for companies to reduce their energy usage? Would you expect to see that kind of flattening out in the years ahead? That's a good question. I would say if, if their incentives are just based on reducing the financial cost, then probably. Because the financial cost associated with energy is going to become a smaller and smaller fraction, then they're not going to focus on that. It's not going to be a big part in their value chain to focus on. Whereas, if we make the energy cost reduction an explicit goal, then they will. And I think I've shown you that that's an important thing to focus on as well. Excuse me. Ask about the criterion. You basically said when when can we hit the break even point most quickly, but you could also say how could we maximize the amount of fossil fuels offset at twenty fifty or twenty one hundred or something like that. My intuition is that would give quite a different perspective in terms of the emphasis on growth versus capacity factor versus the learning curve. Um so let me just double check if I've got the question right. So instead of looking at it purely in terms of whether it's net energy sink or source, the best strategy in order to have some emissions reduction by 2050. Is that what you mean? It's an integral problem rather than a differential problem. Yeah, I see. Um, yeah, I think you would get a different result. Um, and my sense is, just like thinking off the top of my head, it might then be preferential to do something like in install as much capacity as you can for a few years and then kind of slow down growth or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, I think we have one over here. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, would you care, would you care to hazard a guess about how concentrating solar thermal would compare on this? Um, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, so some of the estimates, I have looked a little bit at estimates of solar thermal. And it was a long time ago. And off the top of my head, I think the um, embodied energy costs are comparable. As far as growth rate, I wouldn't be able to tell you off the top of my head what the growth rate is. So, yeah, I can half answer you and not the other half. But it, I mean, that, that's exactly the sorts of things that I want to then now apply this idea to. But unfortunately, the data is less on um, solar thermal. Yeah. Okay. Um, do we have one last question? Um, okay. Over there. Yeah. Will your next step involve uh, looking at the energy consumed in uh, recollecting? the already deployed PV panels, uh, the recycling costs, and then how those new inputs are then recycled into the model that, I, that you have now? Um, maybe. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you picked up on that. I'd, I'd kind of ignored uh, operating costs and decommissioning costs. Um, I think an issue with that is that so essentially, you could say that you, you install this PV system, and after its lifetime is finished, you kind of unpackage it, and you've still got this silicon wafer, which is still pretty good, could be reconditioned. I think that's fine, as long as you have some kind of standardized um, PV module. Yeah, until that's the case, then you've got all of these different modules which with different kind of size wafers, and it's just a bit of a nightmare. Well, I understand the laminating process makes it very difficult to disassemble a module. So really kind of grinding it up and you know, burning off what you can burn off and collect what you can collect would be you know, ideally. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't have a good sense of how much benefit you would get from trying to remake the panel from an old panel versus um, doing it from scratch again. Yeah, I don't have a good sense of that. I would think that there would be some benefit, much like there is for recycled aluminum versus uh, virgin. But yeah, I, I don't have a good sense of that, unfortunately. Okay, well, thank you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.